at your beautiful home in Atherton, California for a talk by Tom Freedom. It's going to be depressing, isn't it? It depends. Okay. Uh, there, there is hope, but there, the, before one has hope, one must have fear. Really? Because I think there's a lot of fear going on today, especially with the job losses, GM, all sorts of things. That's going a near-term fear. Yeah. Uh, the other fears are a little longer Global term, warming. but perhaps a little more severe. Uh huh. I mean, we could be fully employed, but you know, really, uh, you know, underwater in other in other ways. Absolutely. What is your takeaway from his book? It's got, you know, it's called Hot, Flat, Crowded. Um, well, there are many. Um, I would say that the most significant is that we we seriously need to change our public policy and mm -hmm. price signals to if we want to affect change at scale. Right. And can Silicon Valley do that? You know, there was the green print yesterday, all sorts of things going on in the area. Um, Silicon Valley cannot do it alone. Um, the United States can't do it alone. It's going to be a global effort. Okay. You're hopeful though, right? On this sunny, I'm, I'm optimistic. Day. I'm, I'm doing my part in, in, in various ways, but uh, I, I hope I'm really particularly hopeful now that we have a government that will prioritize this. Great. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. This is the crowd. I'm going to see Tom Friedman. Hello, crowd. It's hot, flat, and crowded here today. I just like saying that over and over again. I shouldn't. It's a really depressing idea. It's high a turnout rate of people accepting our invitations. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure it was because they were expecting lots of food and drink. I'm sorry, there's only water. No, in, the, in reality, it's Tom. Um, we can never get enough of him, and uh, we're really honored to have him today. Tom Friedman, what are you going to talk about today? Uh, I'm going to talk about hot, flat, and crowded. Uh, I'm going to talk about my latest thinking on hot, flat, and crowded. All basically, right. try to uh, lay out an argument for um, where we're going right now in the new Obama administration. Uh huh. And where do you think that is? Briefly. Um, you know, I think they're off to a good start, but uh -huh. uh, got to have a price signal. Without a price on carbon, clear, right. long-term, fixed, and durable, it's not going to happen. And how does the economic crisis, which got worse, even worse today, and seems yeah. to be going downward, affect all this? Well, obviously, it makes putting that price, you know, on more difficult, but uh -huh. I think also more necessary because how are we going to pay for all this? Stuff? Right. Absolutely. At some point, we have to pay for it, and we need to pay for it in a way that will also, I think, drive a green economy and drive new industry. And I think. Right, tax shifting, mm -hmm. putting a tax on carbon and lowering payroll taxes, mm -hmm. I think is the smartest way to do and, it. And can Silicon Valley do this, or does it have to come from where? Because Silicon Valley believer, is hot on it. I'm a believer in innovation, not regulation, so right. I think ultimately it's an innovation problem. And it's, it's not really, just a trendy thing with Silicon Valley, you don't think? No, it's, it's got a, this is a job for engineers and scientists. Great. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, I can't wait Karen. to hear you. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, we had lost our groove as a country, and um, this book was actually written uh, as a strategy for how we get our groove back. And for me, energy and environment was really just an allegory <laughs> of the next great problem out there. And the argument of the book was that we really can't, I think, lead the world unless we lead the world in solving the next great set of problems. And I think they're all problems that flow out of hot, flat, and crowded. Um, engineering. Swiss innovation, American nothing. Uh, someone actually thought that the best way to sell their product was to advertise that it had American nothing inside. What it's all about. Well, hot obviously refers to global warming. The fact that global average temperatures have risen uh, almost one degree centigrade, a degree and a half Fahrenheit heading for, for two degrees. That's what hot's about. And I know what you're thinking. Uh, you mean all this Al Gore stuff? All this Al Gore stuff is about just two, two degrees Fahrenheit? That's right, it is because the global climate system is actually a lot like your body. If your body temperature goes from 98.6 to 100.6, you, you don't feel so good. If it goes from 100.6 to 102.6, you call the doctor. And if it goes from 102.6 to 104.6, you go to the hospital. We're having global warming here. You know, to a kid from Minnesota, global warming sounds like golf in February. Okay. All right. That really sounds like nothing I, I really want to avoid. Now, we're actually going to have global weirding. What actually happens when the climate changes is that the weather gets weird. The hots get hotter, the dries get longer, the wets get heavier, the snows get thicker, the most violent storm can and likely will become more numerous. That's what actually happens with climate change. But let's party, because um, there is absolutely, uh, in the face of that list of challenges, there isn't a chance 
Oh, we're going to survive this one. Gary and Laura, thank you. Let's party. Okay? Um, that's one way to look at that list. I look at that list, though, the way John Gardner of Common Cause once described a list like that. He said that kind of list, that, that kind of list. That's a list of incredible opportunities masquerading as insoluble problems. T, the most abundant, cheap, reliable, clean electrons and molecules, will have the most national security, economic security, environmental security, intellectual security, competitive companies, healthy environment, and global respect. That country must be the United States of America. I mean, speaking to this audience, you know, I can say this categorically. You know, I, I covered the IT revolution and wrote about it in The World is Flat. So many of you participated in it. And there was just, correct me if I'm wrong, one rule in the IT revolution, change or die, adapt or die. It, it was not change your brand or die. It wasn't somebody give me a green racing stripe for my stationery or die. No, it was change or die. There's a whole group of IT companies that aren't with us anymore. DECA, Data General, Burroughs, they're not with us anymore. They're in that great IT heaven in the sky. Because they did not change and so they died. You'll know the green revolution is here when you have to change or die. And you'll know the green revolution is over and has been won when the word green disappears. Focus is really how do we stimulate an ecosystem that will generate 10,000 green garages with 10,000 green innovators trying 10,000 things, a thousand of which will be promising, a hundred of which will be way cool, and two of which will be the next green Google and green Microsoft. There is, I think, so much to admire in that eulogy. The conviction that the future is our choice, not our fate. That when you put people together, you put the planet together. That there is nothing in the universe quite as powerful as six billion minds wrapping around one problem. And most of all, the best expression of sober optimism I've ever heard. We have exactly enough time starting now. Friends, we need to redefine green and I think rediscover America. And in doing so, I think rediscover ourselves and what it means to be Americans. We are all pilgrims again. We are all sailing on the Mayflower anew. We have not been to this shore before. If we fail to recognize that, we will indeed become just one more endangered species. But if we rise to this challenge and truly become the regeneration, redefining green and rediscovering, reviving, and regenerating America, we and the world will not only survive but thrive in an age that is hot, flat, and crowded. Thank you very much.